the Savior Jesus Christ according to Mark. Jesus took with him Peter and James and John, and he led them up a high mountain apart by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his clothes became dazzling white, such as no one on earth could bleach them. And there appeared to them Elijah with Moses, who were talking with Jesus. Then Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. They did not know what to say, for they were terrified. Then a cloud overshadowed them, and from the cloud there came a voice, This is my son, the beloved, and listen to him. Suddenly, when they looked around, they saw no one with them anymore, but only Jesus. As they were coming down the mountain, he ordered them to tell no one about what they had seen until after the Son of Man had risen from the dead. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. If you're left feeling confused about that gospel text for this morning, you're not alone. New Testament scholar and professor at Luther Seminary in St. Paul, Minnesota, Matt Skinner, had this to say about the text. He said, I've been doing this work for over 15 years and I still don't understand what the transfiguration means. So as you can see, even the biblical scholars have a difficult time in trying to make sense of this amazing text. And now you also know why our annual meeting almost always falls on this Sunday, so I don't have to try and explain it to you either. <laughs> All joking aside, I believe the transfiguration is really not meant to be so much fully understood as it is to be appreciated. After all, this, this moment of awe and amazement is one of three pivotal moments in the Gospel of Mark during which Jesus' identity is affirmed and revealed by God. The first happens at the very beginning of the Gospel. Think back to the, the beginning of Mark, right after Jesus is baptized. Jesus hears a voice from heaven saying, you are my son, my beloved. The, the second moment happens right here in the transfiguration. This time the voice from heaven is heard by all those who are surrounding Jesus. Peter and James and John, they all hear that voice from the cloud saying, this is my son, my beloved. And then God adds something else. Listen to him. The third time is at the end of the gospel, after the crucifixion. After Jesus cries out in a loud voice and breathes his last, remember what happens. The centurion standing close by shouts, Surely this man was the Son of God. So at a minimum, what the transfiguration should help us to understand alongside these other pivotal moments in the gospel is that there is something about this Jesus that's otherworldly. There's a deep mystery about him, about how he carries himself in the world and about how he relates back to God. If there's anything that we should take home from the text for this day, perhaps it's simply that we should lean even more deeply into that mystery that is, that is our faith, that is Jesus, that is God. With this theme of mystery that I will begin talking about the things related to our 2023 program year and then lay out some of my hopes for 2024. Scholar of homiletics and preaching, David Schnesta Jakobsen, suggests that in the mystery that is the transfiguration, there is something deeply true, yet only in the process of being revealed. There is something deeply true, yet only in the process of being revealed. 
I think that's a perfect way to describe what has been happening here at Grace in the three and a half years that we've been serving together. This community, and not in a bad way at all, has and continues to hold mystery. And with each year that that passes, there is something deeply true that is being revealed about who we are together, about where we're going. Looking back to the first year and a half of our time together, that, that mystery was severely heightened. All we could know and glean of each other was what we could gain through the lenses of cameras and TV screens and Zoom chats and emails. Slowly but surely, we would be allowed to come back into our buildings but we would come back a different people, still holding love in our hearts, but changed nonetheless because of what was happening in the world around us. And and while the height of that mystery was less so than when we couldn't see each other face to face, there was still that mystery of getting to know each other and re-know each other on a human level. When we came back in, we couldn't shake hands. We couldn't give each other hugs. We could only see our eyeballs. We couldn't see the rest of each other's faces. And in some ways, that time when we were allowed to come back into our buildings, but mandatory social distancing and masking had to happen, that was even more difficult than not being allowed here to begin with. Everything that we knew once upon a time about this place, about how we interacted with each other, about how we interacted with God through worship, all of that was suddenly different. But in that difference, in those moments of mystery, something deeply true was being revealed about us. It's still being revealed. I don't know if you can see it or you've been able to spot it, but one of the deep truths that has been revealed to me in my three and a half years with you is that this is a resilient community that is passionate about caring for the other, about welcoming the stranger and about spreading the love of God. If you need proof of that, look around the room. Look back at that annual meeting. Look at how we've grown as a church since the onset of the pandemic. We're about to bust out of the seams in this space. That's why we're having worship discussions during Lent. Look back at the annual report that was just emailed out to you. We've done some pretty amazing work this year, my friends, and and that work right now deserves a round of applause. Give yourselves a round of applause. Are we perfect? No. Have there been bumps in the road? Oh yeah, some pretty big ones. But despite those bumps, big and small and everything in between, we're still here. And though our community might be smaller in numbers than it once was back in the height of the Christian boom in the 90s and early 2000s, I think we might be even stronger than we've ever been before. Stronger because I know for a fact that all of you who are here today, who are an active part of this community, who are working for the good of God's kingdom in the world, you're doing so because you want to be a part of something good. I can tell you without a bit of doubt in my heart that this place is good. In the words of Peter to Jesus on that holy mountain, it is good for us to be here. It is good for us to be here. And it's good for us to be here because like that holy mountain up top which the transfiguration of Jesus occurred, this place too is holy. From the moment we step off the blacktop road and onto the red brick sidewalk that leads up to the steps of our church, we step on the holy ground. That should humble us, my friends, because it's a privilege to have this holy space to call our own. But because it's a privilege, we should not and we should never take this place for granted. Generations upon generations of people have worshipped here have cared for this church and and the properties around our campus. They've filled these spaces with prayers of acclamation, of celebration, of, of lament. We have a duty to keep those prayers alive by keeping this place alive. Thanks to the good work of the various groups and committees that we've established here at Grace, and thanks to the foresight of some of the people who've worked hard on those groups in years past, so far we've been able to fulfill that duty. 
you've read that annual report, you will have taken note of some of the good things. The, the roof on the parish hall, the, the new playground being built. Vance asked me about the mulch in the parking lot. <laughs> as long as I am your rector, we will continue to fulfill this duty. But that also means we've got some work cut out for us. The parish hall especially is still showing signs of aging. But we can do the work. We also have a duty to continue telling our story and telling it in a way that shows the whole picture of who we are and how we came to be. This hallowed holy ground upon which our little church sits did not always belong to us. Before we came, others occupied this land. And, and like we're thankful for the generations of generations of people who cared for this place and kept its mission a reality, we also need to be thankful for the generations of indigenous peoples who came before us and who also cared and stewarded this beautiful piece of land that we are now privileged to call our spiritual home. In addition to being thankful, we must also be prepared as a community to do the work of acknowledging our wrongdoings as a church and how we came to acquire this holy land, as well as who helped to build this church walls. Let me be clear. This does not mean that we as a church right here, right now, in 2024, are a group of bad people. Nor does it mean that all of those who came before us and helped to build up this beautiful place and fill this place with prayers and worship were bad people either. Furthermore, it does not mean that we should fill ourselves and our consciences with guilt and be riddled and, and consumed with shame. None of that stuff is what I'm saying. Instead, when we do this kind of work, it means that we are a people who are taking our faith seriously because when we do the work, we are standing firm with the God who we are worshiping right now and who only wants love and justice and mercy and reconciliation for all of God's children. We're part of that work, whether we like it or not, because our church had a part to play in some of the wrongdoings of the past, we have a time to play in making those wrongs better. We can't make everything right that was once so wrong, but we can and we will do our best to make things better. As I stated with respect to caring for our buildings and grounds, Say it again, when it comes to the work of telling the fullness of our story, it will continue to be a priority of mine as long as I am here with you. So as we move in to 2024, with our call to walk in love and to welcome all and to become even more a beloved community than we already are, we will continue to do our best about telling our whole story. And what is more, making sure that when tourists and, and visitors come here to Grace, they will leave with an appreciation of the deepness of our love, not just for our holy land, but for the fact that we love all of God's children unconditionally. Because after all, that's our mission. To restore all people to unity with God and each other by doing the acts of love that Jesus taught us to do. And all the while we do that restorative work, we should do well to take delight in that, in that which is being done because that's the example that God sets for us. The story we heard today, the story of the transfiguration, makes it abundantly clear that Jesus, that God rather, takes delight in Jesus. As Christian author Mary Golden once said, delight is an aspect of the holy. Delight is an aspect of the holy. Picking up on this idea, that same professor, Matt Skinner, who said he didn't understand the transfiguration, actually had something good to say here. He says that the scene of the transfiguration is a reminder that this holiness, as a characteristic of God, is participatory and shared. Holiness, as a characteristic of God, is participatory and shared. In other words, God loves, so God interacts with all of us. Holiness is expresses itself in self-giving, for that's what happens when we adore somebody and love somebody and celebrate somebody. We participate in that love. In 2024, 
even more so than we did in 2023. Let us continue to be the holy people that God is calling us to be. And let us take the light in our work and our ministry of caring for the other through our continued acts of self-giving. And all the while we do that work, let us take the light in it. Let us work for the people, especially outside of these walls. But let us also work for the people who are coming here. As we continue to grow, my friends, it will become harder and harder for me and the net and the pastoral care team and the vestry to know the individual needs of all of the people here at Grace. Couple that with the the fact that average Sunday attendance for families is now about one Sunday, maybe two Sundays a month. It makes it all the more difficult to know if somebody's missing, somebody's missing on purpose, or if something else is going on. But if we all share in that work as a community of caring for each other, then we have a chance to keep someone from being left out or overlooked. So if you notice somebody's missing from from church, or someone's missing from one of your small groups, or book discussions, or choir rehearsals, then pick up the phone and call them. (coughs) Send them an email. Send them a text. Let them know you're, you're thinking about them, and then take it one step further. Ask them how you can pray for them. That work not only transforms the person who you're contacting, but it transforms you, and it transforms this community, because it shows that we care for each other. Also, if you know somebody who wants a visit from the clergy or who feels like they're being left out of things here, encourage those folks to call me. Call Nanette. I hope you've figured out by now that we're not really all that scary to talk to. And and what is more, we really enjoy talking with you and getting to know you and helping you through whatever it is you're going through. We want to make sure that we are doing our best to care for each other here at Grace But that responsibility lies with all of us, not just with me and the net and the vestry and the pastoral care team. A mark of the Christian community and one of the best things about Grace Church is that we care for each other. We love each other. So let's continue to work together to do that work to the best of our abilities. As I stated in my letter for the annual report, I'm humbled by the amount of good work that Grace does and by the love that we continually give. What is more is that I am honored to be serving along with such fine people. But I believe we can do more. I believe we can be even more. That's one of the oldest churches in America and one of the oldest, if not the oldest, establishment right here in Yorktown I want people to know that this place is a spiritual home for anybody who comes through these doors, that this place is a resource for them. There is absolutely no reason why when the local community shows up here, they're shocked to learn that this place is a thriving church community and not just a museum. That narrative should have never happened, my friends, and that narrative should never continue. People, and most especially our community, our local community, they should know who we are and why we do what we do. But in order for that to continue to happen and to happen on an even greater level than it is right now, there's five things that we need to focus on in 2024. One, we need to keep spreading the word and telling others about the good news that happens both here and out there in the world. Check that annual report if you need suggestions. Two, we need to keep imagining creative ways to be the hands and feet of Jesus out there in the world. Three, we need to keep learning and telling the truth about our full story and how we are becoming a better people day by day because of the hard work that we're putting in being formed by God. Four, we need to keep showing up here. We need to make coming to church and the events that we hold as a community a priority because what happens when we are here is we are formed by the love of God and that not only benefits us as individuals, but us as a community. And five, and most importantly, after we're formed by that love, we need to go out those doors and give it all away. We need to give it away. A couple of Sundays ago, I said to you that there's no shortage of evil in this world that needs to be exercised like an exorcism. That work of exercising evil begins with reminding the rest of the world that there's no shortage of love either. So 
2024 and beyond. Let us keep walking. Let us keep walking in love, welcoming all. Let's keep giving that love away. Because at the end of the day, if you know something is really that amazing and good and life-changing, then why would you want to keep it all for yourselves? God certainly didn't believe that keeping Jesus all to himself was the way to do business, so why should we? Thank you, Grace Church, for being you. Thank you for the, the way that you give. Thank you for the way that you serve. Thank you for the way that you love. Thank you for the way that you show up. Here's to the rest of 2024, and let's keep on walking, my friends. Amen. Amen. Stand as you are able as we confess our faith in the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God. Begotten, not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was laid in heaven. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. In peace, we pray to you, Lord God. For all people in their daily life and work. For our families, friends, and neighbors, and for those who are alone. For this community, the nation, and the world. For all who work for justice, freedom, and peace. For the just and proper use of your creation. For the victims of hunger, fear, injustice, and oppression. For all who are in danger, sorrow, or any kind of trouble. For those who minister to the sick, the friendless, and the needy. For the peace and unity of the Church of God. For all who proclaim the gospel and all who seek the truth. For Michael, our presiding bishop, and Susan, our bishop, and for all bishops and other ministers. For all who serve God in his church. For the special needs and concerns of this congregation, especially Jewel Thomas, Mary Jo Nesser, Brad Brown, Thea, Foster Ryan, Elizabeth O'Brien, Faith Gross, John Atkinson, Brian Wilson, Aaron Cheetah, Quincy Daniel, for Austin and for Beverly Beck, 
and those who we name at this time. Hear us, Lord. For your mercy is great. We thank you, Lord, for all the blessings of this life, especially for the altar flowers, which are given by Caroline Griffith in loving memory of her sister, Christine, and our Alabama family, by Laura Boyce in memory of Sue Cundiff, and by Sue Hawks for the grace of the Holy Spirit. We also thank you for our friends and partners in outreach and mission, especially the Boys Home of Virginia and Holy Cross School in Belize, who we are supporting with our Thanksgiving basket this month. We will exalt you, O God, our King, and praise your name forever and ever. We pray for all who have died, that they may have a place in your eternal kingdom, and we pray, pray especially for Lavon Falconeri, Troy Brown, Ruby Ziegler, Judy Owens, Jack McFadden, and those we name at this time. Lord, let your loving kindness be upon them. We pray to you also for the forgiveness of our sins. Have mercy upon us, most merciful Father. In your compassion, forgive us our sins, known and unknown, things done and left undone. And so uphold us by your Spirit, that we may be good and serve for you in newness of life, to the honor and glory of your name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you. Forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness and by the power of the Holy Spirit. Keep you in eternal life. Amen. Amen. May the peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen.